It's good to be with you this morning. I appreciate you praying for me as by God's grace, I'm starting to get on the tail end of this virus and um, continue to pray for those in our church who are struggling with it right now and also those in the village. You know, this is, we just got to trust the Lord. This is not really the plan. You know, we were getting some good people coming back. We're filling the place up and, uh, you know, it's not my plan. It's God's plan. So I'm going to trust him during this time, and I'm glad that you're here, glad that those of you are watching us online, God has got a plan, and he's working his plan, and we're, we're going to trust him. Uh, we're about to get into Hebrews. It's a very complex text, and by God's grace, we're going to be really encouraged. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we do pray for those right now who are struggling um, in the village, uh, some are in the hospital. So I'm right home recovering. We just ask for your healing and for your intervention and protection for the rest. And Lord, we know that you got a plan and help us to trust you no matter what's going on. So Lord, I just ask this morning that you would use this um, imperfect, frail man to, to preach your word and that you would help us to hear and that your word about Jesus will be so lifted up and and impressed upon our hearts and our minds that we would just be changed and we would just worship. Do that work in us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I watch a lot of TV with my kids and some of the stuff we watch are like superhero movies and, and TV shows. And if you haven't watched those in a while, they're a lot different than when I was growing up. When I was growing up, it was just the basic superheroes like, like Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman and, and to a lesser extent, Spider-Man. But, but now the stuff I'm watching with my kids, I've never heard of these people. There's like um, movies called Black Widow Captain Marvel, there's TV shows like Loki, WandaVision, Falcon and Winter Soldier. I never heard of that stuff. But I tell you what, it's pretty good. It's pretty good because back in the old days, you know, you, you had bad guys and good guys and you just hope the good guys win. But now these superheroes are complicated. There's some mixture of bad and good. But I tell you what, the main thing has not changed and it's this. The world is broken and there are some serious problems and we need a hero to come and save the day. It's basically how the show goes. And you can just kind of take that and apply that to us and to our world. You could say, okay, we have a broken world and we need a hero to come and save the day. But I think it's really good to get more specific to say that we are broken. I'm broken. Inside I'm broken. I need a hero to come and save my life, to save me. And we'll see what that means later on, to save. But we know that this hero is Jesus. And get this, it's not like this hero Jesus, he kind of swoops in, saves the day, and he's like, I'm out of here, see you later. This is a hero who comes down to this earth and he enters into the suffering he enters into the pains. He enters into the problems. And he, he solves them, obviously, through his suffering and death, but he's not done with us. He still is entering into our pain and problems of the day to save us from our sins, forgive us from our sins, to comfort us, to give us peace. It's ongoing ministry of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I need ongoing ministry of Jesus. I really do. I think about this book that I just started reading by Nancy Guthrie. It's a book called God Does His Best Work With Empty. God Does His Best Work With Empty. Anybody empty in here? <laughs> Going through some stuff? You're thinking, I, I'm out. I've had some losses in my life. I've had some major losses this summer. You've had some losses. Some of you have lost your spouse this past year. Some of you have had some conflicts that just messed some things up. Some of you have lost your health. There's a lot of loss in our lives and emptiness. And we can either turn to the world for comfort. We can turn to the world for fulfillment. Or we can go to God and say, I'm empty. <laughs> Do your best work now. And that's when Jesus will come and minister to us and fulfill us and give us himself. And that's what we're going to see this morning as we're looking at Hebrews. Once again, Hebrews chapter 2. And it's a very, very complicated 
passage because it's a lot of Old Testament quotations and applications. But just kind of know the, the main focus here is on Jesus. If anybody asks you what the sermon was about this morning, you just say Jesus. That's the answer. Jesus is our hero. And to kind of get the lay of the land where we're going, we're going to talk about humans and then we're going to talk about the God-man, a human and the God-man being Jesus Christ. And we're going to start with humans, and it's a quote the author is using Psalm 8 as a description of human beings and the world to come. So let's start with Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 5. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Here's the deal. God created humans. And one day we're going to rule like we were meant to rule. When Christ comes back, establishes his kingdom, we're going to reign and rule with him. Because the original plan is for humans created in the image of God, crowned with glory and honor, we are, were to rule and have dominion with no sin over this earth. That's the original plan, perfection. But if you haven't noticed, we have busted that plan and sin has come into the world. Something has gone terribly wrong. The world is no longer subjected to us. We're not in control. Look what's going on right now. We're not controlled. Things wear out and break. People wear out and break. We get hurt and ultimately die. So the plan we were to rule the busted plan, we've messed that up. And now we have the redeemed plan where one is going to come and fulfill God's original plan and that one in the redeemed plan is our hero, Jesus. Look at verse 10. We can read nine first. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Let's go ahead and just stop there. So here's the the plan. We were supposed to rule. We busted the plan. Now God's redeemed plan is that Jesus has now stooped down to this earth. And for a while, a little lower than the angels. He came and lived among us. And lived the life that we failed to live. He tasted the death that we deserved. And he turned away the wrath of God. Now all those who are in this God-man will rule one day under his lordship in the world to come. So we have the plan, the busted plan, the redeemed plan. Now before we look more further at the redeemed plan of Jesus our hero and what he has done, you need to know once again that he has entered our world to save us. He didn't just pop in and pop out. He has this ongoing continual ministry to you right now who may be struggling. For those of you right now who feel this emptiness, you need to know that God sees you and God cares. Yesterday I was watching um, football and for some reason I was watching the Iowa game and after the first quarter, I mean, if you, if you saw this, they probably do this all the time. But after the first quarter of the Iowa game, they paused. And the whole stadium started to wave at the kids in the windows of the children's hospital that overlooks the stadium. It's crazy. So kids with cancer, kids that are very sick are in the windows, and they're waving. And the whole stadium of everybody in there, is turning around, waving at them. And it goes on for a while. The opposing team, the the home team, the coaches, the announcers, everybody's waving at the sick kids in the window saying, we see you, we care, we're waving at you. 
You may think that you're isolated and no one sees you and no one cares. You need to know God sees you. God cares what's going on with your life right now. He's not absent. He's not distant. He is there. He's not a hero that swoops in and says the day is out. He's here right now. So you need to know, and we're talking about the original plan, the busted plan, and the redeemed plan, that God is involved in your life, your pain, your stuff right now. Continue on. Let's elaborate on this redeemed plan. Verse 10. It says, for it was fitting for him for whom all things and through whom all things are in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Now let's, let's kind of just keep looking at this, okay? So children, that's us, we're destined for glory. Glory is in the place we'll experience God. And there is hope for this original tension for man's role to rule in splendor because the hero has come. Now notice here, look, look in verse 10 again. It's called, Jesus is called the author of their salvation. Other verses, uh, translations maybe say originer of their salvation or pioneer or trailblazer that takes us to glory. But probably more accurately within this context, the emphasis should be, should be on the fact that he is our champion. He is our hero. Jesus comes down, humbles himself on this earth, lower than angels, aggressively destroys the devil, frees us from bondage to the fear of death, forgives our sins, bears the wrath of God, and takes us to glory. So Jesus is the hero, the originator. But here's what's astounding, and what really blows my mind, is that our hero is bringing us to glory through suffering. Our hero is bringing us to glory through suffering. And I know I keep harping on this, but there is really a lot of suffering going on. I don't know if I just had a bad two weeks or what, but there's a lot going on in people's lives. I mean, if you look out and you talk to people, I know maybe not so much in the village, but there's like this mental health crisis thing going on, especially among teenagers. I mean, it was bad before the pandemic, but we're seeing teens being crushed in their isolation. Some of them are committing suicide, and and we see that's what's going on with teens. But I tell you what, that's also going on in the village right now. I would say there's a mental health crisis going on in the village right now where a lot of people are in their houses, holed up, isolated, disconnected from people. They're not getting out. And then some of them are struggling with illness at the same time. My heart has been hurting because you have people holed up in their homes, isolated, suffering right now, alone. They can't get out. They can't be around people because of what's going on. And they need to know, because they're not here this morning, you need to know if you're listening that Jesus is with you in your suffering. He is so with you in your suffering. And in fact, that was part of the plan that Jesus was going to redeem you in your suffering and that he was going to be with you in your suffering. And isn't it crazy? Why didn't God just snap some fingers and save us? Why did he do the plan like this? Why did he send his son to suffer? What? what, what, what? Well, the Bible says in verse 10 that it was fitting. You see it then? For it was fitting for him. It was appropriate in keeping with who he is and how he runs the universe. And so since all creation exists for him, then God can set the rules and he has determined the way he's going to bring us to heaven. And it says specifically that he sent his son on a mission of suffering to take on flesh and then to die. That's the way he chose to pull it off. And and notice it once again in verse 10. I mean, the 10 is the verse, man. It says, to perfect, at the very end, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that, that Jesus was morally imperfect. No, Jesus has always been sinless and had no need for moral perfection. 
Well, the idea here of bringing their author of the salvation through sufferings, perfecting him, has the idea of bringing it to an end or to making complete. Uh, The meaning is that Jesus uh, was sent on this mission of suffering in order to bring us to glory, and he accomplished that mission through suffering and dying on the cross. And so now Jesus is perfect in this functional sense. That is to say he is fully equipped to say because he has finished the mission of suffering. We can't ever say, Jesus, you didn't finish the mission. (laughs) You didn't finish it because I'm still hurting. No, no. He finished the mission of suffering on the cross, bearing the wrath of the Father. It is finished. It is done. And because of his mission of suffering, we can have this relationship with the Father forever. But that's not it. That's not it. (laughs) There's more than that. Also, look at verse 11. Look at this intimate connection we have. Look at verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So get this, get this. Jesus comes down, mission of suffering, he's going to save us. And not just that, he's going to incorporate us into the family of God through his life, death, and resurrection. And now Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. So we're in this family of God. Jesus calls us brethren, brothers and sisters, and now we have this intimate connection with the Father, and the Father is taking care of us no matter what. If I tell you that your Father, your Heavenly Father, and your brother, Jesus Christ, the language used here in this family, taking care of you, which means that you don't need to go anywhere else for fulfillment, you don't need to go anywhere else for satisfaction, You don't need to turn to garbage because you have love from the Father. I don't don't think you get this because let me kind of explain it to the way you get this, all right? I just have to admit something to you. I'm not proud of it, but back in the day when I would take my kids to the movie theater, I didn't want to buy movie popcorn because it costs like $1,000 or whatever, right? And so I noticed people in the movie before me throwing their half full buckets of popcorn away in the trash. And I thought, I'm going to use that. And so I would reach into the trash and get the popcorn out and say, look, kids, we got popcorn. I mean, I could afford popcorn, but I just gave them that. And so it reminded me of this story because uh, this past week, my wife and I went out for a walk. And we lived by a donut place and we passed a dumpster. And my wife said, I wonder if there's donuts in there. (laughs) And I said, I wonder if there's donuts in there too. And I looked it up and there was donuts in there. And I thought, you know, I don't need to bring my kids home dumpster donuts. I can provide for my kids now. How much more our father We're in the family of God. We don't need to go to garbage. He gives us everything in him. We're in the family now. Don't turn to that junk. Your father loves you. We go to him for fulfillment. Keep finishing up here. This is is getting really good and complicated. I don't need to slow down because this is really hard to to pack this in. So I'm just going to go 12 and 13. Let's look at it. So this is what the, Jesus says. He says, I will, in verse 12, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Now, what in the world's going on? Right? This, this first quote is from Psalm 22, 22. Now, Psalm 22, if you ever read it, it's all about suffering Messiah. And you may be familiar with a lot of the verses, right, Um, about the suffering Messiah. For example, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's in Psalm 22. Uh, They have pierced my hands and my feet. That's in Psalm 22. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. That's in Psalm 22. So after these verses, we have this joyful declaration, And the joyful declaration, uh, which comes in verse 22, says, I will declare your name to my brothers and the congregation. I will praise you. So the question is, who is talking? Well, the answer is, Jesus is talking. Well, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to God 
in the presence of the church. Peter O'Brien, a great professor, he said, there's like this microphone in heaven that has been beamed down to earth. And now Jesus is exalted in heaven and he's declaring the words of this psalm for us to hear because we are part of God's family. So in the midst of us, as we just read this in the congregation this morning, he's declaring praises to God's name and he's singing praises to God. And we can say that Jesus this morning is the preacher and the worship leader. And he is speaking truth to his church about praises and worship to God. And he is not ashamed to associate with us to say, saying the father sees that we are part of the family and he's making these proclamations in our midst. And that's hard to understand, but let's just make it even more difficult to understand. The, sec, the next two quotes in verse 13, where he says, I will put my trust in him and behold, I and the children whom God has given me. That comes from Isaiah 8. In an original context, Isaiah is being persecuted, but stands firm in his commitment to God, and the remnant stands firm with him. And Isaiah and those with him trust in the Lord and their suffering. And this is quoted in Hebrews to show in a similar way, the son trusts the father, and all those associated with the son also trust the Lord. Just to put it to you in plain language, Jesus trusted the Father all the way to the cross and he was rewarded. And for those of you who are uh, suffering and being burdened by a lot of things and considering bailing on your faith, he's telling the Hebrews, he's telling us, don't do it. Your faith will be rewarded. No matter what you're going through right now, Christian, I'm gonna tell you something. No matter what you're going through right now, Christian, you need to know this is the worst you will ever have it. I don't care how bad it gets for you. This will be the worst you ever have it. You're going to glory to be with Jesus forever. And for those of you who are not believers, this is the best you'll ever have it. Because what awaits you is wrath and hell forever. And so for those of us who trust in Christ, we're not going to bail. We're not going to give up no matter what we're going through because we know where we're going in Jesus who has rescued us. Now we need to get to some really specific things. And I know as you read chapter two, what you really like to focus on is the last part of chapter two because it's the one that really hits us in our hearts right now and our suffering. So let's just go ahead and read some specific things on how Jesus, our hero, continues to help us. Verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who were through fear were subject to slavery all their lives. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Wow, this is amazing. There's so much in this right now. I want to kind of boil it down, and I want us to look at three ways, in closing here, three ways that Jesus helps us. I would say there's three problems that we have that he helps us. Um, and I also want to say the three problems I'm about to talk to you about can really be heightened when you're sick. For those of you who have battled with illness recently, I mean, if it was just physical, maybe you could get through it, right? But it's the mental thing that's going on, right? It feels like some types of spiritual attacks are going on. And so the three problems we're going to talk about here and how Jesus helps us during those things have made, for me, have been really heightened recently. So here's the first problem that Jesus dealt with. Number one problem he dealt with Satan. And Satan who has enslaved us to the fear of death. I mean, that passage says here that Satan is the one who holds the power of death, which he deceptively received when he led humans in rebellion against God. And the wages of sin is death, and the, and the devil has been leading humans to sin throughout history. 
Well, we know that Jesus has come in and he has crushed the devil on the cross, right? He died on the cross and part of that is crushing Satan. And you think to yourself, well, if Satan has been crushed by Jesus on the cross, then why does Satan keep messing with me? You ever wonder that? You're like, well, if Jesus defeated Satan, then why does Satan still seem to have power to mess with me? Well, one of the ways that I've seen it explained is to say that it's like the dragon has been slain, but his tail is still waving back and forth, wrecking havoc. But he's been slain. But one of the ways that the Satan tries to keep you in uh, fear and bondage is to have you afraid of death. Now, I don't just mean the way you're going to die. We, we, we're all probably afraid of how we're going to die. But the idea of being afraid of death and separation from God. I just, I just think about um, those of our brothers and sisters who've had to die alone because family members can't be with them during this time. And I think that is horrible. But to think that's a separation that fear they may have that not only can they not be around family, but that God will abandon them as well. And that's where the truth comes in here. We need to press the truth. You don't need to fear death. You don't need to fear separation from God. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, the fear of death is gone. Because when we die, we gain Christ. We're not going to be separated from him forever. And I do realize that sometimes the fear of death, he goes in and out. But I, I just, if, if you're struggling with that right now, just press upon your mind, your heart, talk to other people. Say, tell me more about Jesus. <laughs> Remind one another about Jesus, how he came and conquered Satan to take away the fear of death so that when you die, you're with God forever. And that brings us to the second problem that Jesus came to deal with. And this is the problem of sin specifically the wrath of God. Verse 17, you see it there, it says, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Well, that's a lot that's so amazing that Jesus is a high priest, took care of the sin problem, took care of the wrath of God problem, I would say your number one problem in life is the wrath of God. And your only solution is Jesus. And if you're trusting in Jesus, you've had your number one problem taken care of. Jesus Christ became a great high priest. It's something he became. He wasn't previously a high priest before he came to this earth. And when he became a high priest, he's able to represent God to man and man to God. And get this, when it came time to make a sacrifice, he was a high priest that in a sense crawled right up there on the altar. And he was the sacrifice. And because of his great sacrifice, right now you can be assured that God's wrath is turned away from you by faith. My last church, I would interact with a certain person who truly felt God's wrath against them. That was their number one struggle in life. That they, no matter what happened, felt that God was against them, that his wrath was on them. And if, if you struggle with things like that, you feel this sense of condemnation, you need to know the same truths that that person needs to know that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient, that Jesus' work is enough. God's wrath was fully and completely poured out on Jesus. It's not a 50-50 deal where God's gonna pour 50% of wrath out on Jesus and 50% out on you. No, it's all on Jesus and through faith, you are shielded, you are forgiven. And I need to tell you now, there's therefore now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Believe it. And here's the last one. Problem number three, temptation. We see in verse 18, for since he himself was tempted and that which he suffered, he's able to come to the aid to those who are tempted. Jesus never sinned, but it tells us that he faced temptation and his suffering. Just think of all the things that you're tempted to do when you suffer. Think about it. 
Think of, if you're lying there in bed struggling with some sickness, it's crazy how new temptations come up and old temptations come up and you think, am I going to ever find a way out of this? Does anybody understand what I'm going through? And the encouragement is he is there to strengthen you, to provide a way out so that you can press on and move through the temptation. We can never, ever, ever, ever say to Jesus, you just don't understand because he does, he's been there and he will comfort you and he'll be that faithful one to enable you to say no to temptation and to take the way out and if you fall, to forgive you. I know I don't have the enthusiasm and the energy to talk about the most most wonderful news ever, but it's really there. Jesus is our hero, dealt with the wrath of God so that you are forgiven, took care of the sin problem so that it is removed. He's with you in your temptations and your sufferings. And after all that truth has bombarded you this morning, you need to know this. God does his best work with empty. So you may feel empty, you may feel blah, you may feel done. You're at the good right spot to be filled up with Jesus. You don't need to turn to garbage. You don't need to turn to trash. You have a merciful and faithful high priest who can meet you no matter what you're going through right now, this morning, for real. Whether you're here, whether you're online, we have a faithful and merciful high priest who's here to meet us right now in our needs. I don't know where you want to go. I don't know where you want to turn, but I think we all collectively should turn together and just hand it all over to the Lord right now. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, through the loss, through the pain, through the sickness, through the temptations, you have come to rescue us. You are our hero. You've been merciful. And I just think about those who've lost their spouse and and being an empty home is, is so tough. Let them know that you love them, that you've not forsaken them. And for those who've lost the abilities they once had, let them know that you care, that you're there. And Lord, for those of us struggling with just whether you know, it's condemnation on us, are you against us? Lord, let us know that you are for us, not against us, constantly caring for us. Lord, those of us faced with temptations, show us that you understand and that you provide a way out. We praise you and we worship you, our merciful and kind and generous high priest. We praise you. Amen.